thank you so very much. Uh, it's a privilege for me to be here, actually. Uh, first time taking a lecture for the AOR class, but I took the, I mean, I took the class, I mean, I took the lecture some 18 years back. So I want to start with a small anecdote. Our lectures used to happen in the library, libra uh, the main library, because that's where the space was. We used to have an additional paper of bookkeeping and accounts, which we had to mug up because we, we didn't know how to make balance sheets. And uh, also, I would like to tell you that I am someone who has a lot of experience in this exam <coughs> because I didn't clear it in the first go. In fact, it took me three efforts to clear the exam. First time I got a, I fell in the regulation, I didn't have the total. Second time I gave one paper, I couldn't clear it. And third time, I was the third time lucky. So I cleared it. So I have good experience of taking this exam also. But I'm sharing this with you because initial years, I was a little embarrassed that I didn't clear it in one go. I wouldn't share this too much. But then I felt that I think the fact that I didn't give up <coughs> giving the exam and uh, I think that I, I deserve some credit for that. And also now that I am, I mean, now I've made a space for myself in this course. So, I mean, you can all see that if somebody like me can fail three times or fail two times and then still succeed. So everyone has hope. But I must tell you that preparing for this exam made me a better lawyer. It made me a better person because the curriculum of this exam is actually like a journey through the last 74 years of the existence of the Supreme Court of India. It is a very fascinating and a very interesting journey. And Honorable Justice Gawai has given a very beautiful snapshot of the judgments. You will have head notes with you. It's an open book exam. But to understand the judgment is really critical so that you know that who was the majority, who was the minority, where that minority became majority, and that journey itself. So I think leading judgments is the journey of Supreme Court for the last 75 years. And it's very fascinating. You should all read it and enjoy it like leisure reading. In fact, you should have started this before last year. Now, what is assigned to me is practice and procedure. So essentially, it is the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court and uh, Supreme Court rules, Limitation Act, and court fee along with that. So I have always had the benefit of very uh, laborious colleagues. I have wonderful colleagues who are here in the audience today who helped me. They made a very nice chart. I think I will recommend that each one of you make a chart like this. If you can see my screen, it's like a flow chart. It starts with, yeah, I think we can share. So it starts with an original jurisdiction, appellate, reference, and then there are two other kinds. So this chart, and then put the articles, put the Supreme Court rule, which is the relevant Supreme Court rule, which, which is the relevant order of the Supreme Court rule, which is relevant, so that it's easy for you to remember. And you, if you like, you can broadly put a court fee to that, that what is the amount of court fee. Because this paper really prepares you um, practice and procedure of the Supreme Court. So you will need to appreciate that chapter of the Constitution along with Supreme Court rules. That handbook is very helpful. I have seen we also uh, have used it many times. So use that also. I'll just give you an overview. I think we don't have uh, enough time for a very lengthy lecture. But I want to give you an overview of this subject. And I want to tell you how, where to find answers, what questions to ask yourself, and how to find answers to that. That will be really my endeavor. So let's start with original. Starts with Article 32, writ petitions, five kind of writs that we've all seen. It's the same that we have studied in the curriculum and as, as law students also. Please revise all those five kinds of writs and see what are the judgments leading up to that. Yeah. And when we go to writs, I think it's very uh, Im important to also appreciate that there is, there, is a, there is a writ jurisdiction that the Supreme Court exercises which is one that is very exclusive to Supreme Court, that is of a continuing mandamus. Justice Gawai is now uh, uh, heading the forest bench that this court has had now for 30, 40 years. T.N. Godavarman is a, is a 
a case that was instituted in 1985. So uh, as somebody who's heading the green bench, the forest bench, as we used to call, is, um, the, is, a, is a case of continuing mandibus. And that is a complete ecosystem in itself. It's like multiple litigations, multiple issues covering various aspects of environment because Supreme Court has really been the custodian, the legatee, the parents patria, if I can call, of the environment litigation, environmental uh, causes. And therefore, the continuing mandamus on forest bench, then there are continuing mandamus on other issues like Taj matter, you know, uh, the heritage, the TTZ corridor came there. So, See some of these continuing mandamus matters. I, though the syllabus is really two lines for this paper, but if you see the last year's paper, paper you will appreciate that it's, there's a lot that goes into it. See, I'm sure you will see the last few years papers as to how, what is it that the examiner is looking at when he asks you questions. So uh, the next point here will be uh, article th 131, the writs. Order 38, Supreme Court rules, order 38. See what is the procedure, broadly see the procedure. And uh, then is original suits, article 131, order 25 to order 37 of the Supreme Court rules. Then you will be able to appreciate how this article 131, how it is an original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. I mean, uh, Union of India, state on one side, multiple states one side, uh, multiple one or more states on one side, but it does not extend to treaties, covenants, agreements, etc. So where that has been examined? What is the, what, there may be a question. So some, the, the examiner may, might ask a question. What about a water dispute? Can that be brought in original jurisdiction to the Supreme Court? So there is a bar. Look at that article also. Don't just confine yourself here. Look at what is the, what are the kind of suits? Can somebody file a suit? Can one of the states file a suit under this? Then is election dispute between the president and the vice president of India. That is original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, Article 71 and Order 46 of the Supreme Court rules. <coughs> then appointment of arbitrators, Section 11.6. Contempt jurisdiction, Article 129. Contempt jurisdiction is something that will have overlapping with the ethics paper and the judgments on ethics because a uh, lot of time it's the lawyers who have been uh, you know criss who have crisscrossed with the with the jurisdiction of the court on contempt jurisdictions vc mishra saab was a, a, a very tall leader of alabad bar when he uh, he gave all of us the leading judgment of vc sharma vc mishra on the ethics case and how the supreme court intertwined it by contempt, and then how the Supreme Court deals with lawyers, parties and person. So you'll have to go into the contempt jurisdiction. Now contempt is also rules are made specifically to deal with contempt. Uh, there are separate rules that are made. So those rules will be very pertinent because that is an original jurisdiction that the court exercises in what manner to proceed. In your drafting paper, form is also important. So when you're preparing for one paper, it's not necessary that you see it only from this perspective. Because if a, if a drafting comes to you for, a, for, filing, for drafting a response to a contempt, or then you have to see in what form it has to go, or a notice for contempt. I mean, when, in, in contempt petitions, for example, if the notice is issued and personal uh, presence is not exempted, it is taken that the, the rules prescribe that. So unless it is exempted, it is taken that the contemnor is required to present themselves personally. These will come, these can come as short questions, but broadly, if you understand the flow of it, it will help you. So please go through the, when you're looking at the substantive article of the constitution, look at the corresponding Supreme Court rule and the form, the, lot of the forms, in what manner they are to be drafted are there in the schedule to the Supreme Court rules. So please make that effort to see that together. Then the next is uh, transfer of cases. Now transfer of cases is again three types. One will be under CPC, one will be under CRPC. Section 25 CPC goes to order 41 of Supreme Court rules. Section 406 of CRPC goes to Order 39 of Supreme Court Rules. And
and article 139 goes to order 40 now article 139a that's the transfer that the the supreme court mostly deals with essentially 99% of that jurisdiction is essentially the matrimonial uh, litigation so in what manner the supreme court has evolved that transfer and how it is uh, laid down that it's the uh, convenience of the wife which is an important consideration and miscarriage of justice so 139 one sorry uh, 139a is not for that sorry uh, section 25 and section 406 is for that 139a is for constitutional questions which are pending either before supreme court or before one or more high courts then it can be transferred either to the supreme court if it's a uh, question of law of uh, constitutional interpretation or if it, it can be transferred to one high court consolidated the recent uh, case we had was though it was really writ petitions but the Agnipat scheme came to be challenged across the country in different high courts and also before supreme court so they were all cases were transferred to the delhi high court the judgment was uh, i mean we argued the matter and the judgment came now we go to the appellate jurisdiction for appellate jurisdiction the first one is article 132 now article 132 this again relates back to interpretation of the constitution but you will you can't just stop at this article the article alone you will have to see what interpretation of what question of the constitution if a question that is already decided will it again be treated as a reference fit for uh, 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 appeal under article 132 no, it is only questions which are not decided so far and it re relates to interpretation of constitution. Then alone this uh, uh, article can, this jurisdiction can be invoked. Then there is uh, civil appellate jurisdiction, article 13, article uh, 133 and order 19 of the Supreme Court rules. Please make that flow chart. I think that's, that's very useful. Once we understand it, then we can explain it better. Now, uh, uh, sorry civil this was civil article 133 now this requires a substantial question of law of general public importance so please see case law on what is a substantial question of law of general public importance don't just stick at that that you know in questions of law we we draft and we say every question is a general uh, importance question please see the supreme court has examined what will be a question of law substantial question of law of general public importance so please use case law to to, 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 yes. Yes, of course. Yes. At least, at least one. No, as, I mean, if there you get bored, one. let me know. <laughs> She wanted I to cut her lecture short, but I I didn't know how much time I, I had, so you can okay. go on because so, this is going to Okay, so I will I will try uh, and complete what I have prepared and if you have any questions then we'll uh, so uh, I mean now it's easy to research. So please when you make this chart, make a lead a judgment, make a leading judgment, put the name of the judgment. Even if you don't remember the SCC citation of it, try to remember the uh, year of it so that you know that what year it is. It's not, I mean, it's, it's really, I mean, I'm not the kind who has uh, photographic memory. That's why it took me three efforts, three attempts. But uh, uh, I think it is, it's all right. They don't, they don't want us to, uh, they're not looking for that, that you can reproduce everything with a photographic memory. I think what the examiners are looking at is what have you understood? And how can you put it together? I mean, do you understand the broader picture? And that is really important. That an year of a judgment is very critical to my mind because it shows how the law is progressing. So how I like to prepare is I like to take one classic judgment, which is essentially at least 20, 30, 40 years back. CB, if it's a constitution bench, that will be great. And one latest judgment on that preposition. So put the article, put substantial question of law, under, uh, under uh, Article 133, if you are looking at the civil ap appeals, examine that and go into it. That will also equip you and empower you to deal with examples, questions of examples that may come. Then the next is criminal appeals. 
that is article 134 order 20 of the supreme court rules now criminal appeals along with criminal appeals you will also have to see the enlargement the enlargement uh, of the jurisdiction of the supreme court because under this there is a now, one is that if there is a acquittal by trial court and the high court in appeal has converted into a death sentence. That is one preposition that comes up. Second preposition is if the high court has directly dealt with it and its high court is the first court and has given. Essentially what they want to see is that there is a death penalty imposed for the first time by the high court. Then it has to be a right of appeal. Then directly it comes as an appeal and in the enlargement uh, act which the parliament has enacted that's not a supreme court act that is a law made by the parliament under article 138 if i'm not wrong yeah thanks so that is made by the parliament and it enlarges the jurisdiction of the supreme court to cover uh, even cases where imprisonment for life has been awarded for the first time so that's the only distinction that uh, that law makes and it is critical to under appreciate that the enlargement has happened in this manner that's article that's the criminal appeal section article 134 then special leave to appeal that's our bread and butter we do this every day 98 99 percent of all litigation is really special leave petitions so it's not so article the criminal appeal the civil appeal under 133 134 and even 132 there has to be a certificate of the high court you have to apply for a certificate you have to satisfy the high court how it raises a substantial question of law of either general public importance under 133 or 134 or interpretation of constitution that has already not been interpreted under 132 now what's the easy way out 136 it is the special leave to appeal therefore slp the special leave petition where you are seeking the leave of the supreme court itself and though the section uh, the article is worded very interestingly it's a very broad article so you can come against any order from any forum any court any tribunal it's a very very it's it's really a very um, it's it's almost akin to that uh, overarching power of the supreme court and that is why it is easy to uh, exercise, easy to, uh, though it is, the, it's a very discretionary power when the, see, you will see that the interpretation, now see article 136, the manner in which it has been interpreted. You will see that the interpretive tool, interpretative tool that the Supreme Court has adopted is where the power is very small, then it is liberally granted. Where the power is very wide, it is very narrowly construed. This is true for all, uh, all, all articles or sections where the power is very wide. So 482 also, CRPC, you will see High Court, that's the same line of judgments that 482 is a very wide power, but it has to be used very sparingly with circumspection. That's the language that the Supreme Court uses. 136 also, that is why you, we see that I think 85% of SLPs get dismissed on admission days even without no, uh, notice being issued because it is an extraordinary power and that extraordinary power in fact initial years when uh, when i used to lose cases i used to feel very emotionally charged up about it so every uh, every time i mean i uh, i had a mentor though i never really had an opportunity to join a seniors chamber I was a young mother even before I could, uh, I had my first case and actually I think I, I took a lot of time in clearing the OR exam also because you didn't help have, have, have helps then. I mean, there was no crash in Supreme Court. There was no, uh, anyways, that's for another day. But uh, so one of my seniors always used to say that, don't get upset, go read article 136 one more time. If you read article 136 one more time, then you will see that it's not that every error they need to correct. It's not every miscarriage of justice they have to correct. It is only a substantial question of law of grave general, grave sub and substantial question of law of general public importance. So that is something that has stayed with me now. I think I'm one uh, law officer who gives a lot of unfit opinions for filing to, to the union for filing SLPs. 
because that is sort of stuck with me that article 136 is not to cure <coughs> every flaw or every every defect so the progression of law and the powers under article 136 is a very fascinating journey and i think we should read it at length please see uh, the order 21 and order 22 that goes with it please see form 28 that is very critical it will help you in your drafting paper also form 28 so anyways you have to i mean you have to mug it up there is no other option go start from the first line and go right up to the declarations you can't miss if there is an error what what do you do in para 1a only you say if there is an error in the parties or anything how you explain the parties what the parties were in the high court anyways it is not a drafting lecture but when you look at slps please look at it comprehensively though because i only have to give practice and procedure lecture to you but you have to give all three exams so please prepare it in this manner that you and when you see the theory of it and see the procedure of it it sort of fits into your silo better and it's easy for you to then reproduce then the the advisory or the now appellate jurisdiction also covers appeals from uh, tribunals and i i also want to mention uh, article 1362 now article 1362 specifically says that uh, there is an exclusion to any order passed by a, a tribunal constituted under the military laws under the armed forces laws so then what happens to afts judgments now armed forces tribunal is something that was created in 2007 i think it's an act of 2007 only okay so 2007 it was created and article section 30 and 31 of that aft act provides a direct appeal to supreme court before that before the armed forces tribunal was created the route that used to be taken was writ jurisdiction under article 226 to the high court and that's how then you would come to supreme court now after the creation of the supreme court a question came as to whether an slp can directly lie from the uh, aft's judgment so shrikant uh, general shrikant forgetting the full name that was a judgment of justice mukhopadhyay that came 7 uh, years back sorry i don't remember the year also but that judgment said that no direct uh, directly you can't come you have to come under uh, the sections 30 and 31 of the aft act but recently the uh, in a in a judgment uh, roger matthews that's a recent judgment last month's judgment of uh, bench of justice call has held that this does not now following the same line as l chandra kumar that article 226 jurisdiction is essential feature the power of judicial review is an essential feature and that cannot be taken away so following that line of judgment they have gone to say that uh, aft's judgment you can if it's because the section 30 and 31 of aft act is also worded like this that it has to be a substantial question of law of general public importance so the argument that was made by the petitioners was that if it is not a substantial question of law but if it's only i as a you know as an individual is aggrieved then if if 31 doesn't allow 136 there is a bar where do i go so then 226 also there is a bar actually but 226 is also read with 227 that is superintendent so 227 there is a bar but 226 there is no bar that's a red jurisdiction so the uh, supreme court held that it can come uh, it can go to high court roger matthews last month's judgment please please see that because as a question it can come it's it's and it's fascinating how many of these tribunals uh, have created direct jurisdiction to supreme court so that essentially also comes into appellate jurisdiction but then when you try to argue it on a miscellaneous day there is no right of appeal there so don't take it to we'll come to questions and answers but uh, let me fi finish my flow and then we'll come to questions and answers i'm not running away i'm here <laughs> so uh, th this aft i just gave you by way of an example because it has the, recently there is a judgment and aft is also some, something that i've dealt with personally a lot uh, but there are other tribunals you should look at how their jurisdictions have evolved uh, for example uh, the the income tax tribunal the the insolvency how you know the ngt 
Uh, NGT, there was also a question of jurisdiction before NGT in what manner it should, uh, how much, I mean, um, so NGT's benches, A, the, where all benches, benches are not there across the country, not every state. So three, three states have one, one bench. And then can they come directly to Supreme Court? So that also last year Supreme Court dealt, I forget, I forgot that judgment. We, I, we had done that matter, but I'm forgetting that. But look at some of these tribunals to see how their jurisdictions have come. So even while preserving and protecting their, their uh, those respective statutes, now that is also law made by the parliament. So that has to be honored. If somebody has been given a statutory right of appeal from a tribunal, it has to be honored. It can't be interfered with. But essentially, additionally, the power of judicial review also has to be protected. So the power of judicial review ha under Article 226 has to be uh, kept intact. That is the line of El Chandra Kumar. Now we come to the advisory or the reference jurisdiction. So the most important is the president's reference under Article 143, Order 42 of the Supreme Court rules. Now this is also an area of huge case law because what can be referred, um, whether a point that is already decided by Supreme Court, can it be referred? What is the binding nature of a judgment given under reference. So these are very, this is again a very fascinating area. I, I would recommend that you do some research on these. Essentially, the law that has been evolved is that ref, uh, in reference, it's the same Supreme Court. So their uh, opinion is entitled to great weight, great constitutional weight, but it cannot be held to be binding because it is essentially an advisory jurisdiction. It is not binding to the president but as an opinion of the Supreme Court, it is binding on all others. So it is, though it is not law declared under Article 141, but still judicial discipline mandates that it has to be respected and um, in that manner. Then reference on points that are already covered is not maintainable because you are essentially trying to reopen. <coughs> I think Cole scam reference was, is, is one very interesting reference because that reference uh, did formulate very interesting uh, stipulations in term, terms of the public trust doctrine and how the uh, the coal mining and how coal is a, a na national asset and the 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 government of the day the state holds it in trust public trust of the of the people of India so that is uh, you should certainly look at that then there is uh, thank you sorry. Reference 1 of 2012. Thank you very much. Sorry, I, I did not <laughs> brush up the citations, which I should have. But uh, I'm, I, I just thought, let me share my thoughts, how to go about it. And uh, SCC research is now easy. You will all sit on the SCC and write down the judgment. But please. Right. <laughs> then the other reference is under Article 317, which is the reference from uh, President or Governor. This is specific to publics. Uh, public Service Commission. So any PSC related issue, removal of a member, etc. can come there. Then removal of a member of any other central government statutory tribunal is covered under Order 44. Um, ITAT is covered under Order 45 of the Supreme Court rules. There's something else that does not really fall in these three buckets. So one is the I mean, review is a separate jurisdiction, so review can probably go in a separate jurisdiction. That's Article 137 and uh, Order 47 of the Supreme Court rules. So you have to be cautious on uh, what is the scope of a review. Only an error apparent on the face of the record or new material which did not, which was not present to the court, which could not be brought despite due diligence at that stage. But I think it is imperative that you look at the uh, some of the uh, judgments on how modification and clarification applications have been dealt with by the court. Because sometimes we as ingenious lawyers, what we do is pata hai review to circulation mein jayegi. So rather than going into a review jurisdiction, we file an application for clarification, for modification. They are registered as MAs. Others are IAs, these are MAs. So they are registered like that. And though early, I mean, under the Supreme Court rules, the registrar has power to lodge them. And then the appeal goes only to a chamber judge under the Supreme Court rules. 
but sometimes we manage to get them listed before court and the court sometimes then uh, you know uh, either imposes cost on us or otherwise allows us to withdraw with liberty to go into review but look at the law how with regard to modification clarification application and review together because these are alternates that have developed uh it's it's very interesting there is i think there is one rule in the supreme court rules which says anything else to do complete justice it's like article 142 of the <coughs> okay all right thank you 47 or so okay whatever it is there is a rule that coincides with article 142 so i think you should look at the emblem of supreme court very carefully yato dharm stato jay it's not satyamev jayate unlike other high courts it is yato dharm stato jay where there is dharma there is jay that is article 142 that's really the understanding of article 142 that in order to do complete justice any order can be passed by the supreme court <coughs> so that is a uh, is is a very uh, exclusive jurisdiction a, a jurisdiction to do complete justice i like to put it in a separate bucket altogether because it is a power to do complete justice and read with article 141 it is the law of the land like all other judgments then one more thing that is developed which is not there anywhere much like a lot of uh, judge made law has developed is curative so curative rupa urra you would have all seen uh, there are uh, that so now supreme court rules the these rules that we deal with these are 2013 rules the earlier rules did not have a provision for curative because this was a this was a creation of Uh, of the so, but I will recommend that you look at how the law developed because prior to Rupa Hurra, what used to happen was pe uh, writ petitions were filed, challenging judicial orders. So the Supreme Court found a mechanism to deal with to create a new jurisdiction in a very in a very narrow conspectus to say that, and they've given examples though though it's they say it's not exhaustive but. i'm yet to see curatives being entertained for any other reasons um but curative essentially so the the order 48 of the supreme court rules specifically uh, prescribes the conditions which are in that judgment so actually when you look at a judgment i think the best way to look at judgments is what was the law before this judgment came and what has been the law after that now where it has gone in fact leading judgments also the way i like to prepare is put it into buckets bucket of constitutional law put then constitution ki kai sab buckets banani padegi part 3 ki alag bucket bana do puri maybe 21 ki bilkul hi alag bana do then see where the law started for each bucket where the law started don't confine yourself only to the list of judgments that is given uh, start with where the law started and where the law is today that is that will give you an understanding which will be uh, which will really be helpful for you in all other Uh, matters also, on all other papers also and then there is article 145 which is the rule making power of the supreme court under which the supreme court rules themselves have been made then uh, there is also the uh, rules to regulate the proceedings for contempt of court that that's a separate rule that has been made and the regulations have been made under the supreme court rules regulations which govern the advocate on record examination in slp there is one more interesting doctrine of merger that also must be seen because uh, there are a lot of questions i saw under and uh, in the last years that are coming that if slp is dismissed can you go back in review if you review is dismissed can you come back in slp what kind of a liberty have you you have to take now there are judgments to deal with this yeah so code distillery is on the merger because they have dealt with it starts with kunaiya mai so kunaiya mai then then go to code distillery and see the doctrine of merger if it is without leave being granted then that's the that's the way it has been looked at but what is the impact if slp is dismissed and question of law is kept open what is the uh, what will be the impact on the parties what will be the impact on someone else these are very uh, interesting questions that we need to all a uh, look at and prepare and find answers to and answer it with case law so uh, sandhya educational society 2014 7 scc 701 is on maintainability of slp against review 
uh, thanks to my colleagues who were able to do some research on this. I otherwise I have not really taken out case law. I was hoping to speak with my experience of 13 years, three times uh, giving the exam in 13 years as an AOR of this court. <laughs> anyway, so then uh, when court has said on maintainability, so that's Sandhya Educational Society, 2014 7SCC 701, Vinod Kapoor, 2012 12SCC 378. And uh, then maintainability of SLP against dismissing review. Actually, I'll give you this note. This note I'll give you so that you can see. But all judgments are not there. It's just a one pager on what are the judgments. I actually have taken out judgments. I mean, my colleagues have taken out judgments only on Article 136 uh, because I, I felt that I won't be able to take you through all. Um, but please see that one and then see, uh, take out judgments by yourself on each of it and please make that flow chart. I think I'm pretty much done.